Welcome to the Craft to Career Podcast with Elizabeth Chapel, where every week we dive into how you can turn your craft into a successful career. Get ready to have the career you've always dreamed of. Hello and welcome to episode 101 of the Craft to Career Podcast. It's still fun and exciting that I'm in the 100s, which brings me to the fun winners. So for the 100th episode last week, I announced that I was going to be doing a free one hour coaching session with one person and then a free month long coaching session with somebody else. There were so many amazing reviews from people who wanted to apply, which just the fact that people wanted to apply was very humbling. But then the fact that they left these amazing reviews, it was, I just want to thank you all. And I wish that I could choose each one of you, that I had enough time to help and mentor coach each one of you. Uh, I did decide to do three, so I'm going to do two people for the one-hour coaching call, and then one person for the month-long coaching mentorship. So let me go ahead and announce the winners. For the two two people who won the one-hour coaching call, I first have Rada of Sewing Through Fog and Stacy Lee Creative. So I'm assuming that's Stacy Lee of Stacy Lee Creative. So no one knows this. This on the podcast is my first time announcing this, sharing this. So congratulations. I'll be reaching out to you. You can reach out to me via DM or I will reach out to you Tuesday of next week. And then for the month long mentorship where we will have a coaching session each week for four weeks. It is Amy Mogren of Ritual Quilt Company. So I am so excited to be able to work with the three of you. And again, thank you everybody who participated, who left a review. This is definitely something that I will consider offering more of in the future because I love it. And I just am really thankful for each of you leaving a review and being a part of the podcast and learning and enjoying from the podcast. So thank you. Thank you. This week, I have a really fun guest, someone who is a friend, an alumni, and you'll hear more about how we met and her story, but it is Maud of The Retro Quilter. So I cannot wait for you to hear more about her story. And in fact, I was a guest on her podcast as well, which will come out soon. So you'll have to check that out as well. But let's jump in and let me introduce you to Maud. Well, Maud, I'm so excited to have you here on the podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Elizabeth. Oh, it is my pleasure. So our history goes back a couple of years, but I was thinking, I don't know, and I'd love to hear how, well, I guess, okay, a little bit on your podcast I've heard, but for this audience, can you share (laughs) how you got into quilting? How did you start quilting? Um, it was actually kind of by accident. Um, let's see, it was Christmas of 2018 and I needed a gift for my dad and I was broke. And so I decided to make him a t-shirt quilt and I thought it can't be that hard, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, but you know, they're, they're their own beast. That's for sure. And that like, that's what got me in and I haven't stopped. I just haven't stopped basically. Yeah. Okay. I'm intrigued about that. I've never done a t-shirt quilt, but I've heard through the grapevine that they're very difficult. And did you use like the interfacing thing? No, I, I didn't. I, I did not know anything. I used, uh, whatever I had, which was scissors, about five pins, (laughs) <laughs> and my wits like I had no clue um but yeah it's like because they're stretch with uh, most t-shirts it it's something I didn't consider when I started <laughs> <laughs> well right you would and, and it's funny because most people when they oh, not most but a lot of people are like oh quilting yeah the t-shirt quilt I'm like oh I won't touch that you know like that's pretty so now my question is how on earth after making that first quilt t-shirt quilt were you like, I love this. I want to do more. 
Well, okay. So it was a little bit because you, you know, you're building it out and you're, you're seeing it come together. And then of course, after I did that for, for dear old dad, I was like, well, my, my stepmother, she's going to need one too. And then I made the, the very smart move into, I'm going to go to the quilt shop and I'm going to buy actual quilting fabric. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and that made a world of difference right there. And so, um, yeah, just like playing around and seeing it sort of come together and build, it was just, it got me hooked. Okay. Yeah. So more of the, the puzzle of cutting apart these t-shirts and putting them together and seeing it take form. Is that what you like? Yeah. About it? Yeah. It was, it was really interesting because like I, I wasn't even using a pattern for those. So I actually remember, this is so funny. I made like a little nine patch and I thought I was very clever. (laughs) (laughs) How did you bind your first quilt? How did that look? Um, oh my goodness. I think I rolled it over and hoped for the best. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I had binding problems for quite some time. Like it took me a while to, to get the binding down. So like, if you look at these, these first quilts, they are warped, like totally warped on the binding (laughs) for sure. I mean, I remember the first quilt I made also, it was just squares Mm -hmm. in like a pattern, you know? And I was like, I'm amazing. But then the binding, I just looked at photos and I was like, huh, I wish I hadn't gifted that quilt just for kicks. Like, so I could look at it. Cause I showed it to my friend who did quilt and she was like, you know, there, there is a method to this. Like she was trying to be so nice about it. <laughs> there is a way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to ask how the binding went for you. Um, so then, okay. How did it go? Your first trip to the quilt shop, your local quilt shop. Oh my goodness. So I, say it's, it was almost like opening the doors to Narnia, you know, right. Like it just was, it was just magical, you know, all these, all these fabrics that are gorgeous and you could find them in so many different things. Like if you want Christmas, here it is. If you want unicorns, there they are. Like it was just a whole new world literally opened up, you know, and it just made me want to play and, and continue to play. I mean, like I just, who doesn't get excited about fabric? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Exactly. Not anyone in our community. Mm -mm. (laughs) Mm -mm. I mean, my kids might beg to differ, but if you're in this audience, (laughs) you're in the right place. Exactly. You started with just the nine patch. How did you discover quilt patterns? Um, actually that was my mom. So I did those first two quilts and my mom basically was like, okay, let's rein it in here. (laughs) Um, And she handed me a trip around the world pattern and basically was like, I'd like it in cranberry go. (laughs) (laughs) So that was it. And like that whole process of being like, oh, I can actually make something cohesive (laughs) was really amazing too so yeah and then um hooked hooked again you know so how was it reading your first pattern were there certain things that you're like what is this what does this mean oh yeah um I was like what's quarter inch um seam allowance and things and just just little things that I didn't even know until later it was like Oh, you can buy a a quarter inch foot with like a a partition that will help you keep that. If I had only known, you know, like all these things that I was learning on my own, um, mostly through trial and error. And then from, you know, Instagram and YouTube and library books and all the things. Well, okay. How did you discover the quarter inch uh, press or foot for her sewing machine? I got... I think I got a new um, sewing machine that came with it. And I was like, what? Like, so before that, I had finally just put down some tape and and kind of MacGyvered it. Um, (laughs) But even that, that took a while to even realize like, oh, I should probably put some tape down to help me out. You know, like you just, you don't know until you know. 
Yeah. I will say for me, like I started quilting in what, 2016? Mm -hmm. Instagram was alive and thriving. And I learned a ton from people's Instagrams. I was like, oh, and they would show, I still remember Pat Sloan had a baby lock sewing machine with the laser guide. And I was Mm -hmm. like, what is that? Oh, I need that. Um, Yeah. The tape, the presser foot, all those things. So when did you go out and find your first pattern of your own accord? Obviously your mom introduced you to like, oh, there's actually quilt patterns. Then when did you go find your own? And I'm curious what your first pattern is that you like purchased of your own accord. Oh my goodness. I don't know exactly what that was because it was like, I I basically discovered the quilterverse on Instagram and I I think I bought so many patterns all at once it was just you know a kid in a candy store and I remember uh Libs Elliot then came June Penelope handmade I was just like I want to make all the things um but I think it really wasn't until I found um the fresh as a daisy quilt by pen and paper patterns that I was like, oh, the, this speaks to me, you know, I, yeah, I made that quilt a, a number of times. Oh, yeah. we'll have yeah. to have a picture of that. Oh yeah. I, I made it a few times. I love that pattern. That's very fitting for you. Yes. I can see, <laughs> I can see that resonating with you. I'm out of curiosity. What other patterns out there have you seen that you're like, oh, that's, that is me. Like lately? Uh, just in, in the history of your quilting experience, are there any that come to mind that you're like, oh, this one? Oh my goodness. So, um, Miss Make, she mm-hmm. did the looper I love. And recently she did her Omega that I am just dying, uh, over, um, even lo and behold, she just, she's coming out with this granny patch thing, which kind of made me a little bit sad because I was kind of working on something similar to that, but hers is just so darn good that like, I can't help, but I, I want to make it so bad. Um, and love so modern Erin, she just mm-hmm. came out with radical cassettes and oh my goodness, it's just perfection. Truly, you know, yes, it is. I'm so happy with yeah. Well, and lo and behold, she did like an eighties with the black background and these bright colors. Yes. I was like, yes. oh, I can see that also resonating with me. So, okay. Then how did you, when, like, what did it look like in your mind when you were like, wait a minute, I could write patterns too. Like, how did that happen? Okay. So, well, obviously my style is retro. <laughs> um, And so when I decided to look for, for specifically kind of retro patterns out there, I discovered that one, there wasn't too many. And the ones that I did find were at a much higher skill level than I was at. Um, So I thought, oh, well, that's a little nook to be filled. And um, so that's, that's the direction I went in. (laughs) Yeah. So when did you write your first pattern? Uh, so I, well, I took your core. Oh no, actually, sorry. Let me back up. Um, my first pattern I wrote, it was kind of a, not a great experience actually. Um, I had seen a fabric company, I won't say who, and they were looking for quilt pattern designers. Um, they had, were reaching out on Instagram and I had just gone EQ8 and I reached out saying like, I would love to check this out, maybe help you out, but I don't know how to write a pattern. I can put the, the blocks in the little squares and, and all the things, but they said, okay, we'll help you. So I was like, okay, great. And so I had to really learn on the fly and it was really disheartening because I was trying my best to write a pattern. And it was almost like handing in your homework and then you getting it back with like all red marker all over it. So I felt really incompetent and it was just really crushing. Um, So I took that experience and one, I knew 
I wanted to do it more, but I also knew I needed to learn how to do it properly. So that was actually very, very soon after that experience, um, kind of serendipitously, I discovered your pattern writing course and I was like, okay, well, my answers are (laughs) (laughs) And so I took your course and then I wrote my very, my first pattern as the retro quilter. And that is me. And I, and, and that came out in February of just last year. Really? It feels like so much longer. Yeah. I know. I'm like, you've been doing this for years. Wow. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It's been like a year. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's crazy. You've had a lot of success in a very short amount of time. Good job. I did not put that all together. <laughs> Thank you. So, but okay, let's chat about this first experience you had. Again, no names, but it's not unusual because I experienced that as well. I, I know I work with people who are learning. Like, first of all, there there needs to be room for people to to learn and to make mistakes right mm-hmm. like everyone starts somewhere and so and i felt that when i first started even with people saying like you can't write patterns that's kind of a big thing to do you don't just jump in and do it which i find very insulting i'm like all of these people have figured it out i i know i'm a capable person like mm-hmm. you can't say i can't um but also no one really shares how to, you know, it's like, but, and I was searching I for you. I don't know. I was searching all the blog posts and everything yeah. like how yeah. to do this. And it was all very surfacey. I was like, no, but I really got to know, like, like the meat, how do you do this? You know? Oh yeah. Even when I would see other, uh, designers ask me anything, I'd be like, okay, I will. And I would <laughs> <laughs> ask all the questions, but, um, it wasn't enough because there, there ultimately is a lot to learn a lot. There is. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, even like with my students, you go through the course once and it's not like you're this proficient quilt pattern writer. Like you've got to jump in and do it a couple of times. I mean, it's like learning a new language or learning anything, you know? Um, so your very first pattern that you released is called that was Boogie Nights, and I developed that in your pattern writing course. Yeah, and that came out, yeah, February of last year, so just over a year ago. And it had curves for your very first pattern. I still I remember. <laughs> I remember you like, how do I make this image? Did you take a photo and put it in your pattern, or did you create the image in Adobe Illustrator? Uh, I did it in EQ8 first because I was learning Adobe in your course. So, um, yeah, there might've been a few tears learning, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was through, um, EQ8 that I did it initially and I didn't, I was not confident with curves then like it, and which is crazy because that's all I do. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, that was sort of like the the start of doing all the curves for me too. Which I love that kind of, what's the word? Attitude, like bootstraps. You're like, I'm not super confident, but I know I want my pattern to have this. So I'm going to become confident. And like you do it over and over again. And here you are. Now you do curves all the time. Like it warms my heart to see that kind of like, I'm going to do this, you know? Yeah. What is, what is that? Gusto? I, don't I know. I was like <laughs> gumption, but that seems like a negative connotation. So I'll come up know. with the right word when we're gone and done. But. <laughs> um, so can you share a your process of coming up with a new pattern design? So you had Boogie Nights mm-hmm. and then you released Retro mm-hmm. Daisy? No, um, March last year, I did Stellar. That is my free pattern. Um, it's the only one I have without curves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. Um, yeah, that one I love and I'm really proud that there is an inclusive version for free with that one. And then, and then it was Retro Daisy was after that. So that was spring going into summer of last year. Yeah. And would you say from my perspective, outside looking in, I would say that like really was popular and like, Mm -hmm. 
that one, I think that's the one that really propelled my business and my growth for sure. Um, I, I don't know. It just took off. Like people were liking it and saving it, um, that weren't even quilters, you know? Oh, and, cool. Yeah. And from that success, I was actually able to do my first quilt along, which was so fun. It was, was so it? Fun. Okay. Tell yeah. us why was that so fun? So with my first quilt along, okay, first off, I got some amazing sponsors. So the prizes were great and who doesn't love great prizes. Right. But, um, but also I really love, I mean, with all the things that I try to do, my podcast, like all the stuff, I try to have a community element to it. So within the quilt along, I actually had weekly, um, meetings, I guess. And we would just talk about that week's um, task at hand, what problems you had, let's do a little show and tell kind of thing. Um, how can we help? This is what worked for me, blah, blah, blah. And it was great. And so, and like all those people that participated, we still chat. Um, I just saw one of the girls at QuiltCon recently. And so, yeah, like we made friends just by doing that even. And that was great. That, I mean, as a business owner, especially where, you know, our line of business, we're at home, we're behind the computer screen or the sewing machine. That connection is huge. It's very rewarding as a business yeah. owner, but it's, it's also fun. I feel like that's why I do. That's why we do, you know, we create these patterns, but to have that connection and it's very valuable for, for our customers to connect with you. Did you host that on zoom or where was yeah. that held? Yep. Yeah, just on zoom. And then because my availability is basically when my kids are in school. So, I mean, that's not everybody's availability. So it was recorded and then I would send it out to the folks that had signed up. And so even if you weren't there participating, people still felt like they were included, which was really fun. That's so, really cool. Yeah, yeah. That adds a lot of value. I like that. So, okay. This is like Elizabeth's ADHD brain at my kids. Now I want to ask about your kids. What do your kids think about your business? Oh my goodness. They are the sweetest little supporters. So, um, my youngest is six. My oldest is eight. (laughs) And actually, um, not too long ago, my eight-year-old discovered that one of the teachers at his school was going to become a grandmother. And so he was like, well, my mom has to make a quilt for you. She's the retro quilter, you know, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is so adorable. <laughs> sure enough, she ended up like buying a quilt. <laughs> um, but they they have sewn with me. They love coloring in my color sheets. They want to play on EQ8. Like they're constantly saying, Mom, can I design a quilt? Um, the two of them just designed this quilt together. It's very impressive. And then they went, So mom, can you make this? And I'm looking at it. It's the most intricate thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, that would take me 20 years. Like, <laughs> you but they have care. A- oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it, they're just, they're so sweet. And it's really wonderful to see, like, they're proud of me, you know, and it's, it's really heartwarming. That's adorable. Mm-hmm. I am curious. To, we'll circle back when they're teenagers because uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Right. So, okay. I know we chatted. Well, okay. Last what, January, we did the mentorship. Um, yeah. And I remember you were going to uh, tell me if I am remembering this right, but you would like go to vintage shops and find dishes and like retro things to try and inspire you for patterns is this an accurate memory um okay so pretty much if I'm not sewing or you know doing my groceries whatever that kind of stuff I I want to be at a thrift store um I love thrifting I love retro my house is retro I've worked in a vintage shop before um So yeah, that is where I get my inspiration. I get my inspiration from like patterns, furniture, um, even just like styles. Mid-century modern is definitely huge for me, but even like um, a brutalist style, like there's just so much, so much into it. I just think it's all just 
so cool. But yeah, I, I love thrifting. I love it. <laughs> you know how legit you sound by throwing out those terms <laughs> mid century I don't even know this other one. Brutalist? What's that? Brutalist. Yeah. It's like really, I don't know, chunky and boxy and hmm. br- brutal. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, sounds very brutal. <laughs> You know what? If you created an opt-in, a free opt-in with that just talked about different genres, I would want that. Like I'm intrigued by that, especially as a designer, because I've seen people like, anyways, I'm just gonna throw that out there. <laughs> we'll chat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, that's funny. Um, so one sec, let me look here. Okay, so. What would you say is the hardest part for you about coming up with a quilt pattern design? Um, I think I put a lot of pressure on it being unique enough. Um, I think that's just something I have within me in general. I like to be different. I like to be unique. Um, and then the other thing is trying to not only use curves now. Um, <laughs> like I've been trying to come up with something with HSTs forever that is retro and it <laughs> um that that is a mission I will accomplish one of these days. But yeah. Okay. I'll be watching that's funny because I only I feel like all I use is half square triangles and I like I had to branch out. But the one pattern that does have curves is my rainbow one, which I feel yeah. like is kind of retro. So yeah, exactly. Right. The curves, I don't know, retro has the connotation of curves. So it's hard to incorporate the other way around. So but it'll happen. Yeah. I'm on yeah. Mission. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't see you in a thrift shop looking for that inspiration. <laughs> Which I do have to say, I was so pleasantly surprised when we had the mentorship and we were on Zoom calls and I I can't remember if I saw your kitchen or you shared a poster, but like Elvis, you have an Elvis something in your house? Oh, oh An God. Elvis bus, yeah. An Elvis what? It's a bus, like. <laughs> oh, like a bust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like, I don't know. That was, oh. That's one, that's one of my prized possessions. I have to keep it away from my children. <laughs> <laughs> An Elvis quilt. Could you, would you? I don't know. I have, I have some other ideas that are like deliberate like that, that I'm toying around with right now. I don't know. I don't know if I'm that much of an Elvis fan that I would do that. Okay. Cause it is a statement thing to like, you know, an Elvis yeah. quilt. But that could be really fun. That could be really fun though. But you could do, you could be dazzled that and it would be so fun. <laughs> yes. oh, I love where your mind goes. <laughs> but I mean, point is like you are retro through and through. I want to even say in your kitchen, don't you have like a vintage dining booth? Or yeah, something? my my house is is retro. So my kitchen. Um, when we first moved in, so I live in like a 50s, 60s type bungalow. And when we moved in, the kitchen was carpeted. Oh my. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> right. Gross. So we got the black and white checkered floor put in and there's a little nook. And I just, I happened to find, um, orange because I love orange, uh, a little booth and it's from like an old hotel because Niagara Falls there's like a bunch mm. of old hotels so yeah it's like I've got my own like little booth and and Pyrex display and things like that yeah I love it <laughs> like it's just so genuine and part of who you are plus I love like you exude this cool aura like you've got these <laughs> tattoos and you've got this nose ring and like you're just <laughs> You did roller derby and you did hair and your husband is your tattoo artist. Like all these <laughs> things. I'm like, you're the coolest person I've ever oh met. <laughs> well, thank you. Because honestly, like, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like I'm like the cool person. I was never like the cool person. I just always sort of did what I wanted anyway, though, you know, you know what blossoming now it's like Mindy Kaling. Do you know who she is from the office? Yeah. Yep. She talks about that. Like it's better to blossom when you're older than when you're, you don't want to peak in junior high or high school. So right. yeah, but, um, I'm pretty fortunate enough that like, I, I like tattoos and my husband happens to be a tattoo artist. <laughs> I 
I wish, I mean, I've toyed with the idea, even, even my hairdresser now, I was like, I'm thinking of getting, I have this like skin discoloration. I was like, what if I got a tattoo there just to cover it up? She's like, that's just not you. You're very elegant. And I was like, it's true. Like I wish, so maybe I kind of envy you in this weird way of like alter Elizabeth would be you, you know? <laughs> I just, yeah. Right. Like I get that, but I don't know. I even feel like I, I would love to be way more covered and, and, and just even head to toe, but I just don't have that in me. So it's kind of funny because to you, I'm probably covered, but to me, I'm like, oh, I could be way more covered. And I totally envy the women <laughs> that could do that, but I just don't have that in me, you know? Really? How come? Do you feel like, I don't, I don't know. well, one, I'm older and I just don't have the pain tolerance mm. for it anymore. Um, and you know, if I, if I don't employ my husband to do it all, then they, they can be expensive and stuff too, but it's, it's a look, it's a look. It's a look. I, love I, it. I love it on other women. It's just, I don't know. I kind of want some of my skin. Yeah. Just, you know? Yeah. Me. Yeah. It's cool. I like it. So, okay. We talked about the hardest part of designing a pattern for you. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the most rewarding fun part for you for designing a pattern? Um, I mean, seeing it come together, like playing, playing is always fun. Playing with color, playing with shapes, discovering how color plays off of each other or how like shapes can make repeating patterns and things like this. So it's sort of like the discovery of it is always like, I don't know, it keeps me always coming back for more, you know, yeah. like, I love that feeling. Which, where do you mostly do the playing? Is it in EQ8? Is it in Adobe Illustrator? Um, I think it depends. I, I go back and forth. So it depends on what my intention is. If I have an idea already, um, I might go to Adobe. Um, if I'm just like, I'm just going to sort of mess around and I don't really know what I'm after just yet, I might go to EQ8 because there's more built-ins to it. Um, yeah. And then like, sometimes I get out the good old graph paper and, and do you? I need oh, to do yeah. that. Yeah. And just see what I can do because sometimes I'm just like, this is going to take me forever. If I try to do <laughs> it in Adobe or something first, right? Uh, yes. yes. So it still serves a purpose for sure. And you are very good with color. I know you've toyed with offering like color theory stuff. Are you still thinking about doing that? I don't know. So, I mean, eventually I would really love to do some sort of course. I really haven't decided on what that looks like. Um, but I do want to eventually do something like that because I love helping. I'm, I'm, I'm a helper. Um, but my background is with color. So I used to be a makeup artist. I used to do hair. So obviously within those things. Um, and then prior to that was more art background. So it's color theory through and through. Um, but also like as much as it excites me when you're like hearing analogous colors and secondary and tertiary and things like this, you're just like boring. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, so that excites you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, so um, I mean, like there's fun ways to play with it, but learning the actual theory part is never too exciting to me. And I like, I even get bored of it. It's the actual playing with color that excites me. So I don't know. Yeah. I keep yeah. Talking about it. Well, you have an eye there, so it serves you well. So I'm curious when you are designing, playing around, how do you know when you are done? Like, okay, this is the pattern. And I'm going to move forward with this. It seems so hokey, but it's a feeling. Mm -hmm. I get a feeling, right? Like you just kind of intuitively know, like you got it. And you intuitively know the opposite too, when it's not quite there yet. And you're like, there's something in you that says, no, it's not done. You got to keep tweaking. You got to keep playing whatever it is, but it's, it's a gut feeling for me. You for too? Me, I tell, yeah, I feel like for me, when I 
love it. You know, when I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I want to share it with everybody, you know? And then there's other times where I'm like, mm, do I, I think I love it. If there's that doubt there, then it's like, nope, it's not done yet. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it too, for sure. Yeah. Cause yeah. Yeah. I've just recently designed one that I love, but do you know, okay, this is well, neither here nor there, but eh, kind of it is. So <laughs> I generally feel very confident with like my business, but recently I've like started looking at other people's patterns. I'm like, Oh, I should try that again. They're having success. This is like the number one thing I tell people not to do. So I'm like, okay, you're in a weird headspace. Let's step back a little bit. Do you ever go through that too? Oh my God. Absolutely. I mean, every, I think everybody, if you have social media, you do that at some point, Um, but the important part is doing what you just did and that's catching yourself and having the realization of, oh, I don't need to participate in this. I need to step back, catch myself, do what I need to do, focus on me and not compare myself to others. Like I even just mentioned Brittany of lo and behold, she, she's coming out with this new pattern. I was, I was a little bit sad, not going to lie that, that came out, but at the same hand, it's beautiful and I love it. And I'm so happy that that is out in the world. And so like, it was meant to be, and she was meant to have it out. And that's awesome. You know? So like, I'm just going to put mine on the back burner and leave it where it lies. And you know, that just happens. It happens sometimes. Right. Or if you're just like comparing yourself of, well, so-and-so has got this many followers or this and that, that doesn't mean anything. You might be comparing your beginning to their middle. You might be totally having different avenues, you know, like you and I, we have right. different styles. You, you like to do things a certain way. I like to do things another way. You can't compare apples to oranges just because they're, you know, the same food group. Exactly. Well, and for me, I know when I'm in the headspace of any of that kind of Mm -hmm. weirdness, it's really not a time to be creating anything because it's not coming from the right place. You know, when I'm feeling safe and secure and abundance, Mm -hmm. that's when to create. And so just to kind of sit with it and let it ride out, do the things you can to get in a better place, but it's not the time to be creating because. Yeah. That's so smart because I've done that and you just dig yourself further. Oh yeah. It comes from this scarcity and like almost panic. Like, well, I've got to come up with something amazing and, you know, and it, yeah. it's not, it's yeah. almost like you can see that in the design, like, oh, so, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, okay. I'm very curious when people ask you, so what do you do for work? How do you answer that? <laughs> uh, I just tell them I'm a quilt pattern designer and I love doing that. <laughs> because nine out of 10 times their reaction is like, wait, what? Oh yeah. Uh, Right. Is that's a thing. And you're, and I, yeah, quilting is a thing that the patterns don't just a, appear. So uh, that's what I do. <laughs> right. And it's just, it's fun. I kind of like playing with people's reactions with that. So what's the best reaction you've gotten? Oh my goodness. I think we have at the bank and somebody was like, wait, what? There's like quilting. There's like patterns and things. I'm like, yeah. I'm even going to Pocon. Wait, what? Like just blew this guy's mind, you know? I was showing him pictures and he was like, this is incredible. (laughs) I love it. I have, especially coming from like this really cool hip, you know, like, oh, I usually get, oh, my grandma does that. You know, I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Yeah. Which is great. I love that there's a place for everyone in every age, but the stereotypes that come with, oh yeah, you know, for sure. Certain thing. Uh, so can you share with us touch briefly on you do some brand ambassadorship for some companies? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Yes. So I am a brand ambassador for two different companies. Um, one is arrow sewing furniture. They are absolutely fantastic. They make, um, well, sewing furniture, they make like cutting tables, um, sewing chairs, cabinets, things of the sort. And, um, they actually reached out to me. They were starting a new 
program, like a creator's program, and they were reaching out to um, some individuals that they thought were a good fit. So I got very, very lucky there. Um, the other one I, I'm i an ambassador for is for Aliso Irons, which I just think are the best. Um, and I reached out to them. I just started a conversation and I asked. And good they for said, you. So, yeah. That's cool. So you have both experiences where somebody reached out to you and where mm-hmm. you were like, I love this. I'm just going to reach out and see how it goes. And it worked. But have you reached out to some people and had them say no, just for our listeners who might be feeling? Oh like yeah. That? I mean, um, even with distributors right now, I'm like, that is my number one goal for this year is to get picked up by a few distributors and I've been told no, but that does not mean that I'm going to stop. <laughs> yes. Good. <laughs> good for you. So uh, what's on the horizon for the retro quilter? What can we expect and look forward to? Oh my goodness. Okay. So there's, there's a lot in general that I want to do. Um, I eventually want to design fabric, write a book one day, as I mentioned, I would like to have some sort of course and mentor others. Um, I would like to continue with my podcast and helping others in that direction. Um, But this is, this is like my career choice. So, I mean, obviously like I want to make money with that as well. Um, So the goals financially there would be things like making a reliable, solid wage. Um, I would like to hire someone preferably within the industry, um, that can, you know, like someone who, who has been in my position before, like a part-time parent or whatever it is, um, something of that sort. And then like, eventually I would really love to be able to like, um, give back to some, uh, charities and things, or even starting my own, um, down the line, but that all, all that stuff takes money. So, but you know, I love it. You have to first think it to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And then you put that into the the world and you are a go-getter. Like I, you will, it will happen because you, you do it like you get it done. Uh So I'm excited to see this unfold and take shape. So Uh yeah. Thank you. Well, you've been a very big inspiration for me within that, because I mean, when I first started quilting, I didn't know that you could make money with it. Right. Like I just thought it was a hobby. Um, and that's what it started off for me. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, but for me, I had to figure out a way to make money to support myself quilting because it is very expensive to do this. Um, so, um, and now it's just like, I can't imagine doing anything else. So you've, you've definitely given me the inspiration of what's possible. So thank you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. And I am on a mission for that. Like I want people like you, anyone who is a creative who wants to earn money, like you can, you don't have to be a starving artist and you don't just have to cover your costs, you know, like you mm-hmm. can have a thriving career. So I am excited for you. So for (laughs) our listeners who want to find you, where should they go to find you? So you can find me at www.theretroquilter.com and on Instagram at the retro quilter. I'm also on my podcast, which is called thread and therapy. And you can find me on Instagram at the at Threat and Therapy Podcast. And that is also on my website as well. It is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and other streaming platforms. Awesome. Which is a very fun podcast. We did an episode together that Mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun doing. So you shall go and check that out. So just to end things, if you were to give one piece of advice to someone who's starting a creative career, what would you suggest or share? Okay. So um, at QuiltCon, I had the pleasure of listening to Melody Miller of, um, Ruby Star. She did a lecture and it was amazing. Like I literally laughed, cried, got goosebumps, the whole, the whole bit. Um, the topic was your, your work 
isn't perfect. And that's what makes it good. So, and I, I just really think this is so true. So my advice would be to embrace not being perfect and just going for it anyway. Um, because when you give yourself permission and allow yourself to have grace, there is just so much freedom in that. And because otherwise you're just living up to an illusion of perfection, right? So if you let that go, you're really propelling yourself forward and things can start happening. So I just say, make like Melody Miller and, um, don't, don't strive for perfection. That is beautiful. Oh man. I wish I would have been at that, uh, lecture of hers. That sounds oh, amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. It was, it was so good. So great. I know <laughs> even just hearing it. I mean, thank you for sharing that. I feel like if I wasn't there, at least I got to hear this little tidbit. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here. This was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. Maud, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. I love hearing your creative journey and how, you know, woven throughout your life, you've done these things that are just creative and beautiful. And now here you are in the quilting community, sharing your talent and love and passion with us. And just thank you for sharing your story, your inspiration. You are an inspiration for many people who are thinking of turning their craft into a career. So thank you for being here on the podcast. Next week, I will have a brand new episode of the Craft to Career podcast. Until then, have a lovely week, and I will see you back here next Friday. Mm-hmm.